All right, Vice Mayor. Ladies and gentlemen, the Vice Mayor has called this forum to order. All right, you want me to do the uh, opening? Please. We don't need to do any uh, pledge allegiance or anything, do we? No, no. Um, All right. All right, so the people who are listening um, they may not know too much about what the zoning matrix is and what we've been doing. Uh, this is something that, uh, that we've been looking into for a couple of years now, and we have finally been able to start taking some action, started uh, a few months ago, and um, we've been working pretty hard on it. And what we, what, what, what we were looking at is that um, as our existing zoning code uh, did not reflect 100% of the needs that we had in the community, uh, things like uh, that we're looking at on resiliency, um, you know, the height of the first floor and where you can uh, locate, locate the first floor uh, right now does not allow you to go higher than the BFE. Um, so we're looking at ideas of being able to lift houses up from the first floor for flooding, um, better uh, ways of draining. Um, we're, we're looking at uh, ways to take off um, or more efficient uh, structures uh, for um, uh, I'm trying, photovoltaics or solar panels that we're going to be putting on there in order to reduce some of the uh, electrical loads, uh, things like that. Um, we also want to look at things that can benefit the community better. Uh, we give a lot of bonuses to allow people to build larger houses on the island. And uh, a lot of these are to things that I don't see as big benefits to the entire community. So what we looked at is things like uh, Again, we're having issues with flooding, ways that we can maintain water much better on people's properties in order to reduce flooded streets. Uh, we're also looking at character of the neighborhood, how the houses uh, look uh, like from the streetscape, uh, increasing neighborliness, uh, increasing security, uh, things like uh, looking at the garage. And uh, so basically we're making uh, modifications. So uh, what, we, what we really focused on in this first round was single family homes. And uh, we have not touched base on multifamily yet, commercial, uh, other areas. We do want to do that. But since that we see that the most of the redevelopment that does occur is in our single family, and we thought this would be the best place to start uh, to begin uh, looking at the zoning code. Um, so it's still in a process. Um, we're still developing this. Uh, nothing has been set in stone. Nothing has been brought to council. And tonight is really a time for us to allow the public to chime in, give us your feedback, things that you want to see, things that you see are issues um, so that we can hear them and we can transition into what the adjustments uh, that we might want to see and that we'll bring to council and have discussions for. So that's really what our goal is tonight. It's not to really present anything that we already have been looking at, but we want to hear some of the concerns from uh, the, the public and uh, so that we can take that back as we develop this process. Um, so for that, I think, uh, Andrea, if you want to go ahead and take it from there. Thank you, Vice Mayor Moss, for that introduction and, and the background. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. My name is Andrea Aga. I'm the village manager. Um, I'd like to start by introducing the staff members um, that are here with us that are available to answer questions and that have been working on this project uh, with us. So in case anyone doesn't know, Vice Mayor Moss is a registered architect. So that expertise has been very helpful to us. Uh, we have Roland Samimi. Dr. Samimi is our Chief Resilience and Sustainability Officer. Uh, we have Jake Ozeman, who is a engineer, as well as our Director of BZP, so our Building Department and our Public Works Department. Um, we also have Bill Fair, who is an AICP certified planner um, and our zoning official. And then Chad Friedman is also with us, who is our village attorney and happens to have a lot of background in uh, land use and, and zoning codes. So basically, um, as the mayor said, we've been working on the three categories. There's really four, four categories of the types of amendments that we're looking at. Um, the first category is what we're calling Scribner's errors. So these are simple little references to a section of the code that no longer exists or doesn't make sense. Um, so we're correcting those. Um, the second category is clarification of language. So if there's 
language that's either outdated or not too clear or is subject to interpretation and has been difficult for staff to administer or enforce. We want to clean that language up. So we've got some amendments that fall within that category. The third category is um, when it starts to get a bit more interesting. So we're looking at minor text additions to supplement the existing regulations to help clarify and help us um, interpret and, and use the code more effectively. And category four is where the magic happens. So the fourth category that we're looking at, um, these are the amendments that are more critical in nature to um, preserve our resilience and to address some of the, the sea level rise um, projections that we're expecting. And all of this is to do with uh, the private development on single family homes. Um, Procedurally, we started this um, process of fact finding and information gathering and working with the council members and working with, um, we've had some residents who have been really engaged and I'd, I'd like to take a moment to, to thank um, Clay, Deborah, uh, Mayor Kaplan, um, Heidi, who's the other attorney that worked alongside Chad with us, um, Jose Matos, Mario Garcia Serra, Michelle Estevez, um, Tom Weber are just a few of the folks who have chimed in and shared some um, valuable information to help us kind of move through this process. So our goal today is to take in feedback. Um, I think from a housekeeping perspective, the way we were going to operate, Pete was going to open it up, call on folks who have questions, who have suggestions. We really want to hear um, what your experience was if you were building a property or renovating a property and there were some elements of our code that didn't resonate well with you that you feel um, could be improved upon, in particular those areas that would help us address uh, minimizing the peak flow, so to, to address the flooding issues. Um, if you have comments about setbacks or if you have comments about garages or you know what your experience was with height or um, elevation issues. Um, this is the team of subject matter experts that are here to be able to answer those questions. In the event we are unable to answer your question here tonight, uh, we'll be jotting down those questions and we will get back to you. Um, this this uh, information session is being aired on 77 and we also um, are recording it. So we'll have it available for, for future folks or for anyone who wasn't able to make it here today. Um, this is a series of engagement sessions, and so if thing, as things progress, the more input we get, the better our final product will be. Um, the final step of our work, or the first phase of our work, is going to be after the public engagement and a workshop with council to explain in detail all of the code revisions and what we're doing um, would be an ordinance, uh, two readings, that would codify these amendments um, that would need to be adopted by the town council. So that's where we are. Um, with that, I will, if anyone else has anything to say, we have some elected officials. Um, I'd like to acknowledge Mayor Davey, thank you for being here. Council Member Petros, thank you for being here. Um, and I think those are the council members I see. So thank you guys for your, for your support and interest in this. And uh, Vice Mayor Moss, if there's nothing else you'd like to add, we can turn it over to Pete to start hearing the feedback. Yes, that's fine with me. Great, thank you. All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. If you wish to speak to the council or to the board, um, please plus press star nine on your telephones. Anyone wishing to speak, please press star nine. Um, Vice Mayor, I don't see anyone raising their hand to be heard. Now, Peter, is there, I've heard, I did get a text saying that some people were having a hard time getting on. Is there, is there possibly some people still trying to get in? There are people trickling in slowly. Okay. But there's not many. Right now we have eight. Oh, but we do have one speaker. There we go. All right. Caller with the phone number ending in 906. Please state your name. Caller, you are live. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. This is Michelle Estevez. I was unable to connect through Zoom, live Zoom, 
that's why I'm, I'm here connected through the phone. So maybe some people have problems too. I tried to directly, but asking me for the, after the meeting ID, asking me for the meeting password and we don't have it. So I couldn't connect live to Zoom. So I don't know if we were supposed to or not, but just from the phone. Uh, public access for the public is actually through the telephone only, not through the Zoom app itself. Uh, okay. Well, because in the instructions giving us the options to connect also Zoom, click here and the number. So, okay. So at least you clarify that. that. Be a miscommunication. Uh, I'll find out. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Um, question, sorry, since I, I'm, I'm open. Um, I have been there participating and I'm looking forward when we reach the, the second part for commercial and condominiums. However, um, when more or less we expect that is, we're gonna share this, the changes from the committee to the public at one point and we're gonna, or we're gonna wait for the whole review instead to share some of the changes for the uh, houses first. We have not discussed that, or do you have, or, or, or we have some idea? Yes. So we do. We do have an idea. Thank you for the question. So um, back in November, I brought forth a manager's report to the council that kind of laid out um, our timeline and game plan. Um, due to COVID nineteen, things happened a little out of sequence, but um, basically we have this community forum to obtain the input. Um, any input that we receive through this process or other input that we get, uh, we'll bring it back to, to, you know, to the group to kind of think through and, and make any changes we need to make. And then we are planning on doing a council workshop uh, within the next uh, month or two. We're trying to get a, a, a workshop with council where we can actually provide the specific language and the reasons and the, the, the document that we went through with all the changes that we have. And then once the council feels comfortable with the content and with the information provided, um, we plan on bringing the ordinance addressing the residential single family home district. Um, the goal is first reading for August, and then we'll get through the budget hearings. And then there are two meetings in October. So we plan on trying for the first meeting in October for second reading, and if there is any uh, feedback that we get that we need to amend the ordinance, we can do that at the second, at the second October meeting. So that's our that's our timeline at this point. Okay, and then we'll follow then the the amendment to the ordinance for the commercial and condominiums and you multifamilies. Got you got it. Perfect. Okay. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for your support. All right, again, um, ladies and gentlemen, if you do wish to speak, please press star nine on your telephones. Again, that is, uh, we have one caller with phone number ending in 493. Caller, please state your name. Caller, you are Cecil live. Sanchez. Cecil Sanchez, 260 Cypress Drive. Can I speak? Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Hello? Yes, Cecilia, you can speak. Um, thank you. Th th thank you for having, thank you for having this meeting. Um, as you should be aware, there are several houses, I believe about 20 houses that have sold in the past mm, 20, uh, sorry, two, three months. And there's about nine houses pending. I urge there's going to be construction development going on again on the key. I think I would like our landscaping code to finally get approved. So we have our own, everything is done in-house in the village and not have to go to Durham. We have been patiently waiting for years for this to happen. I, I urge the administration to make it a priority and get this done so that we make sure that our tree canopy is protected, that we know how many trees are here. We're talking about resiliency. Resiliency means many things, including keeping our green canopy. 
the other thing that I am asking is I, I would like to know regarding our ordinance that we have also been pleading with the village to adopt, to adopt is the trash ordinance. Can we do something about enacting with penalties and instructing the residents how is it going to be? How many days do you have before you can put the trash out? How are we going to enforce it? What is the penalty if people don't comply? The same thing about the trash bins. Can we please help make sure that our property values go up, not down? Can we make sure that our trash bins are screened from the street so that we do not have a trash city USA here in our village like we do now? Please, please help us out. We, the Village Beautification Group, Foundation, whatever you want to call us, we are urging the village to make this all a first priority. Thank you. So I can think I can I can speak to some of those points. So Ceci, thanks for for chiming in and for always being here with us at these meetings. It's great. So the council did pass the um, the garbage bin ordinance on first reading at our last meeting, and it is coming before the council for second reading on Tuesday the twenty eighth. So it's right around the corner. Some questions, please. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, that's better. Okay, can I ask a couple questions? Yes, of course. I wanted to know, I wanted a little bit better understanding of bucket number four that you spoke about, Andrea, and with resiliency, and Brett, maybe you can speak to this too. I just wanted residents to have an idea maybe of some of the things that you might be discussing and that they might be expecting coming down the pike with our desire to be a more resilient community. Are you, the things that I'm wondering is, have you been discussing and are you looking for a decreased footprint of houses, single family homes on lots, yes or no? Are you looking at materials that are being used for driveways? Are we gonna be more restrictive and potentially have materials that are more absorbent? Um, what about drainage? Are we gonna be more specific with drainage and potentially setbacks and garages? Those are my four areas I'd like to know about. So I think, the answer I think, is yes to all. Please, yeah, Vice Mayor. I can just go through, I kind of wrote down some of the main items um, that we've gone over just to give you a broad idea. Um, we are looking at incorporating rainwater cisterns to the single family homes. Um, it won't be a requirement. It would be something that would be an incentive. But the way that we're thinking about doing the incentive is that if you want the same lot coverage that we're allowed today, you would have to install a rainwater cistern. If you don't, your lot coverage would have to be smaller in order to over, you know, to compensate so that it would be a decreased size. So if you want to increase the size, then you would have to then install a rainwater cistern that would ultimately be at least used for your irrigation, um, and which would also reduce how much water we would be using uh, on the um, on on each on each house. Uh, we're also looking at uh, requiring pervious driveways that people would have to actually install the driveways to be pervious. And um, that would be an actual requirement. Uh, we want to be have the ability to for people to build higher uh, first floors. I don't know if we came to an exact number. I think it might have been three feet above BFE is last what we were discussing, but it hasn't been set in concrete yet. But it gives you the option to either build at BFE or go higher if you would like to. Um, that would be something that we think is long-term beneficial. Uh, we also would like to incorporate an incentive for solar panels to give you bonus. Um, again, we're not increasing anything that's already existing, but this would just uh, be in place of another bonus that would, you know, allow you to get the uh, additional FAR up to the max that you're allowed today. Um, but we want to really incentivize that solar panels would be something that would help. And that would also reduce the demand that we would have on our substation. Um, we also we're looking at the garages, we want we we this one was have been probably the most controversial talked about 
um, with with the group of uh, people that have been involved. And uh, we have been going back and forth, but we feel that we could bring back garages because there is a benefit. Um, but we are looking at some restrictions that if maybe if you have a closed garage, it would have to be pushed a little bit farther away from the street versus a carport that would be a little closer to the street. Um, I'm not 100% sure that that one's really still liquid. We, you know, we haven't really decided what we're going to do there. And that would be great to hear from a lot of people on that issue. And then the la one of the last big ones we're looking at is um, our porches, exterior spaces along the first floor. Uh, we want, right now, the code is very restrictive and it doesn't allow, for instance, like wraparound porches and stuff. It, it allows for it, but they become very unusable because you max over the gross square footage that's allowed. So we wanted to get some leniencies for the first floor to allow for people to put actual usable porches, which we think is, I mean, at least I personally think is really good for neighborliness, for people to be more active on their ground floor, which which creates a lot more connection, um, you know, through and, and strengthens the community. So we wanted to look at that to see if we can. So, so for me, those are kind of like, I, I don't know if I missed some stuff, Bill, Jake, I know you guys um, do, yeah, but Brett, those are like my Brett, main big oh, ones there. Yeah, Brett, just to clarify, I think you mentioned raising um, elevations above BFE. We talked about also lot elevations and, and maybe, um, yeah, you know, for possibly raising those a little bit. Uh, we haven't come to a concrete number on that, but we're looking at tentatively like, like about a foot right now um, in the front and the rear zones. Just just because, just to, um, to go into the future, you know, with possibly ele elevating roads and walkways and things like that, it would match that. And to match just to match the new construction and not Carl these retaining walls everywhere eventually. That's about the only thing I can add to that or clarify. One other question I have for Roland. Can you do you have experience on the things that would be the most effective within our community specific to resiliency when we're looking at these code changes and which ones you think are the most important? I mean, if I had to, if I had to rank them, um, I'd say because of what we're going to be experiencing relative to roadways, I would start with lot elevations and making sure that those those lots can be sort of filled in and made higher to accommodate any elevations that are going to be needed in the road, which then facilitates also being able to use. Um, swales along the side of the road as a stormwater management tool. Um, I would also, rather than, you know, recommend that people build higher than base flood elevation. I mean, base, rather than say, you can build at base flood elevation, I would recommend right off the bat to allow people to go higher than base flood elevation or re recommend or require that they go higher than base flood elevation is that if that's possible and then also because the system can only handle so much water um capturing as much water on site is is really key now in this in the sense that seawalls are involved i don't know if this if this zoning language or zoning modifications have anything to do with seawalls but i was also i'd also be thinking seawalls and in, in finding a way to to gradually get people to start thinking that seawalls have to go higher. Can I speak to that? Um, the only thing we've kind of touched on with that is it's the seawall elevations are related to the maximum rear zone elevation. So if we're increasing that by a foot, we're increasing that the, the maximum seawall elevation by a foot. That's about all we've touched on so far, but we'll probably have some more discussion on that. Yeah, we probably you, you come consider. into the picture since we wrote that, so we'll probably have to, you know, end on that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. so well, so Dr. Samimi and I have been looking at a couple sample ordinances in other communities that have taken into account um, water brought the sea level rise, rise projections. Um, City of Miami, in particular, has a PowerPoint presentation that they did not too long ago that has some really good data that I <clears throat> circulated with council, and maybe we can share more widely. Um, so I think separate and apart from the zoning code work that we've been doing with um, Bill, um, Dr. Samimi and I are also doing that work. So I think they will dovetail nicely together. Councilmember Petros, does that answer your question? Yes, 
Thank you. And my, I guess my last question, Andrea, would be when do you expect to bring a portion of this before the council? What's the timeline? So our goal is to do the the council workshop um, within the next month or two, and then or within the next month really, and then bring an ordinance for first reading on the August twenty uh, fifth meeting, and then get through the budget hearings in September, and then bring the ordinance back for a second reading, um, the first meeting in October. There are two meetings in October. I want to say the seventeenth of October, but I could double check. But that's what we're targeting now. Would there be a phase in of the ordinance or would it take effect immediately? So it depends on the provisions. Um, we've been working, we've been very effective actually in the way we've been doing this. Um, Chad and or Heidi have, which are the villa from the village attorney's office have been in every um, session with us. So we're actually, they're drafting legal language as we are you know, having these discussions. Um, so I don't know, Chad, if you have any comment on I mean, so far, I don't think any of these would usually, look, the council can do whatever it wants at the end of the day, um, but usually our ordinances always become effective upon adoption. The only time that we have kind of an educational period or a lead-in is if, you know, we feel like it's necessary. Uh, I don't know if the changes that are being required here are rise to that level because a lot of these changes would really kick in for new development as opposed to affecting the existing developments. But again, it's, it's within the council's purview. I mean, one thing we could do, I liked Ceci's comment about, you know, homes starting to turn over and a couple, you know, pending sales. Um, one thing I think we can do is maybe reach out to um, the realtor groups and see who's buying right now and make sure, you know, we can touch base with them if they plan on developing anything new and share with them what we're, what we're thinking so they can start getting in that in that mindset. I just want to add one thing, um, Madam Manager, um, as we move forward with the with the review of these ordinances, it's important for us to look for any opportunities that we have to make changes that will improve our community rating score relative to the National Flood Insurance Program. And um, that's just something to keep in mind because to the extent that we can satisfy some of these, um, these opportunities, these requirements um, to improve our score, that's something that ultimately the community at large will benefit from, you know, should we be able to get our scores better and then reduce the flood insurance premiums that, you know, people may be paying down the line. Do we have any more people from the public that may want to give some feedback, some insight? I don't see anyone currently. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you wish to speak, please press star nine on your phones. Everybody's been very quiet. It's a quiet group today. Uh, Vice Mayor, I don't see anyone else. Mayor, do you have any questions? I have many questions, uh, but uh, I'll take them offline for you. Now, I know I, I saw some people were having a tough time getting on, uh, but uh, I appreciate you putting this on tonight to, uh, to educate us more about what's going on. I know this has been a, it's been a long-term process. Bill's have been involved in this quite a few times. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's always interesting. And I just want to make sure we get enough community input. Um, I know you, you've worked hard with, uh, with Clay and Deborah and, and Michelle and everybody. So, you know, the more input we can get, the better. Um, I would only question the timeline of having another meeting in August. Um, you know, obviously we want to get this done as soon as possible, but my question is, are we really going to have another meeting? We've got a lot of budget stuff to deal with. We've got a lot of issues coming up in the next month or so. Um, I don't know if, you know, that's going to be the will of the council at that point. Right. Vice Mayor, it looks like we do have one caller or two callers that wish to speak. Uh, the first caller will be phone number ending in 518. Caller, please state your name. Caller, you are live. Hello? Yes, hello, sir. Yeah, my name is Pedro Kolishkin. I live in uh, Richwood Road. Uh, it's a reference to, I don't know if there's a correct forum for this, 
it's a reference to carport and garages. I'm not fully familiar with the with the code ordinance on that. Can somebody can somebody be so kind to explain me uh, why? Like for example, we have a lot of expensive houses. You go around Key Biscayne and you see a lot of expensive houses and, and expensive cars and only a carport. And uh, some of us would like to, for example, enclose the carport to protect at least uh, two cars. If you, you have an expensive house and you have an expensive car and you have a carport, uh, what can we do so we can protect those cars? It's not even pretty when you go around Key Biscayne and you see all those garages with a bunch of bicycles and junk and things like that. That is not even pretty. What can the city do to improve that and let people have a garage? Uh, again, I'm not fully familiar with that. If somebody could be so kind to explain me uh, what is on that, what we can do, what the, what the city could do to improve that. Ready to take that? Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, um, sir. I, yeah. Um, what ha I, let me give you a little background first before I tell you where we're going with this. Um, the last uh, zoning revisions in Zork in 2000, and I believe it was when we changed the ordinance, we used to allow garages facing the street and all that. And, and there was um, concern with that of garages predominating the front. So there was, it, there may have been a little re overreaction and an ordinance is written to basically allow um, on a majority of the lots, only one bay to face the street on, on the smaller lots, on the larger lots, no bays. So it was a real deterrent for building garages. Um, it just became detrimental. And you're right, that's when we saw just a huge turnover to carports everywhere. And I think the general consensus is, as you're saying, it's, it's not, hasn't been as pleasant. Although there's a lot of things stored out front on end. So we're, we're, we're addressing that in, the, in this, um, in these proposals. We're actually addressing your concerns exactly. Cause we've had a lot of feedback on that um, by, First of all, um, bringing back the option for um, garages facing the street with a little more setback and also um, specifying design a little bit more to uh, the, the details to match the house and that kind of thing. So I think you'll be pleased to know we're bringing that back. And and we are all still allowing carports to be closer to the street and we're allowing um, <clears throat> limited enclosure. So they're still kind of see-through, but we're allowing ornament on the facade so you don't see as much, as much into them. So I think you'll be, the community will be very pleased with what we've got proposed regarding that. Does that kind of clarify things for you or do you? Do you, you... Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, what is your name again? So I know who to follow up with on this. <laughs> yeah, my name is, my name is William Fair, F-E-H-R is my name. All right. I'm there, I'm there, Thank well, well in normal times I'm there every day. Right now, not so much, but <laughs> I'm there. Uh, 8.30 to 4.30. All right. Thank you very okay. much. And you call me anytime. I'm, I'm, I'm in the book on the website. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, Vice Mayor, we have one more caller. The phone number ending in 675. Caller, please state your name. Yes, hi, uh, this is Miguel Piedra. I live at 677 Ridgewood Road. Thank you all for, for hosting this meeting tonight. I just wanted to raise a point um, that uh, Vice Mayor Moss brought up about higher elevation on new builds. Um, and I want to make sure that we take into consideration that there are many houses on the key that are not elevated, that are not small mackles anymore, that have had you know additions done over the years. Um, and if we, you know, if we encourage all new builds to go even higher than they already are. Houses like mine, where my neighbor's pool, if I'm standing in my backyard and I'm looking at my neighbor's pool, it's pretty much under um, under my chin and her retention wall is taller than I am when I'm standing in my yard. And so doing, continuing to do that will have a very negative effect on property values and flooding situations for houses like mine that are not knockdowns and that nobody, if I were to sell it, would pay the price you know, that I, you know, that I would have to sell it for to knock it down. And I think that, you know, I get sea level rise is going up, but there are a lot of us who own homes who've made huge investments in Key Biscayne. And the more we do that without taking into consideration that not every home on Key Biscayne for the next 10 or 20 years will be an elevated home, 
you know, every time another house, the one in front of me is higher, the one behind me is higher, the one to the left of me is higher. If the one on the right now becomes higher, you know, I become the toilet bowl of Key Biscayne in essence. So I just want to make sure that, that we keep that in mind because I think that's a huge implication for those of us that are not in a house that will be elevated, you know, anytime in the near future. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And we're trying to address it also with some of the uh, drainage and water collection issues, because right now a lot of these higher lots, you know, they're just draining directly off. They're supposed to keep it on their lot, but when you have an extreme circumstance, that water will overflow and go into lower areas, which is we see that it can end up in neighbor's yards. So we're hoping that if your square footage of your roof is covered with a certain size tank, it would reduce a lot of that water that's on there. But that is something that we've been considering. We've been talking about that. Um, we have people, you know, that are participating that have that issue as well. Um, so that uh, I think is something important. Uh, and and it's, it's difficult. It's not an easy solution. Uh, but just because the first floor is higher, it doesn't mean the entire structure is going to be higher. It's just that they can move up, up the floor. And actually, it could have a better effect because people may actually continue to use the underside of, you know, for parking underneath their house, um, which actually can lower some of that area as well. So there could be a trade-off at the same time um, by allowing people to build higher than BFE uh, too. But it is a difficult but, but I think, situation. I, we have I'm to sorry, be very, very careful. Yeah, the, the only thing, though, is if we're talking about raising lot elevations, you know, I already see it. If anybody stands in my backyard and looks at my neighbor um, to the left of me, I, her pool is at eye level already. It's like so much higher than, than me. So if we're talking about raising lot elevations, and then I have a hard time understanding how these water, because we're located on coral rocks, and when, these, when it's high tide, if it rains a couple drops, everything is flooded how these tanks are going to prevent that when we're already pretty much, you know, at sea level. So I don't understand how adding these tanks will, will eliminate some of the water where there's like, there's not much, there's not really that many places for it to go when we're so close to, to the coral. Yeah. Maybe Jake can speak to the engineering behind that. And I also have it while it's on my mind, if you have to all the residents in the community that's on the line with us, if you have specific case studies or pictures that are illustrative of either things that you think are working well that you'd like to see more of or things that are not working for you, you can email them to Mr. Fair, W-F-E-H-R, at kibiscane.fl.gov. So those pictures will help us um, help the council understand some of the issues that the community is facing and what solutions we're proposing. So. Um, Jake, if you'd kindly answer the, that, the question on the engineering side. Um, sure. I, I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to show the graph. If I can do it. Okay. You guys see my uh, hydrograph, my screen? Mm, yes. Okay. All right. So this, a lot of people are not familiar with this graph now, as you see on TV every night. Uh, when they refer to, to flatten the curve, right? That's almost like number of patients up here, and then you have the hospital uh, capacity down here. So stormwater works the same way. Let's say, uh, I'm just going to do a line here. That's your base flow, okay? And uh, that's the system that it's already um, uh, taking groundwater or or any other discharge uh, without a rain event, okay? And then the system gets up here at this level when there's a major rain event, okay? So the so difference between these two both lines, two both red lines are actually the flood, okay? So now what you do is there are a number of uh, techniques that you can reduce this peak flow so that your 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 uh, flood amount reduces. So if you do, I'll do a line. Maybe if I bring it to like use a a a, um, a uh, blue roof or blue green roof, I take this top area off, right? And then I use another technique, um, cistern rainwater harvesting. I, I lower the pig flow, and then I do um, paved. Uh, permeable pavers. 
So when you apply all these um, applications to your stormwater management, the area I'm going to try to hatch is basically becomes the flood volume. So that's how it helps. It has nothing to do with uh, the, the groundwater elevation uh, or how close you are to the level. What matters is what system can uh, take at any given moment and what the peak flow would be in a rain event and what techniques we use to reduce the peak flow so that the, the stormwater system is not overburdened. So rainwater cisterns is a good application. Um, uh, vegetated swales are good. The, the less hardscape, uh, more vegetation is is a uh, good good application for reducing peak flow. Um, permeable pavers is another option. Uh, blue roofs, uh, those are the areas that holds uh, the stormwater almost like a mini swimming pool up in your roof and, and with a limited discharge. Green roofs, uh, plantings on the roofs, that's another technique to, to reduce the pit flow. So those are the, the, the collectively uh, as referred as green, green infrastructure, infrastructure techniques that help reduce the pit flow so that the system is not uh, overburdened. I don't know if I confused you even more or helped it, but uh, that's my nerdy explanation. Jake, when you start talking hydrographs, I start smiling. <laughs> so, so the caller, did that answer your question? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm dialed in on the phone because I couldn't get in on the um on the zoom meeting there was there was a requiring a path code so i didn't get to see the illustration i guess I'll, I'll see it on the playback oh okay all right vice mayor well i uh if there's not anybody else who has anything else to discuss i think that would probably conclude our meeting for, for today. And then, um, you know, I think it will give the opportunity to the public to come to the workshop when we work with council, when we bring these up for ordinance reviews. Um, I think that would be a great place to bring some more of this information and uh, before make any final decision so we can make any adjustments if needed. Great. Well, thank right. you, Vice Mayor. And thank you, Mayor. Thank, thank you, you Councilor Petros. Thank you everybody for coming and, and the public for being here and, um, and all the board, uh, very helpful and a whole lot of hard work. And we've been working on this since I think September. So uh, pretty, pretty uh, detailed, uh, you know, a lot of work going on in here. So I'm very happy to see that we're coming to the end and uh, hopefully we, you know, end up with something great. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everyone. Bye.